For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lieber Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent Program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective, created by Raymond Chandler and brought to you on the air by Pepsodent and starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste, New Pepsodent with Irium. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. Yes, in a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three to one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with a toothpaste they were using at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other brand they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, in a recent survey, families three to one said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. Now we invite you to hear Van Heflin as the Hollywood private eye, Philip Marlowe. Quiet. <coughs> you there, Marlowe. Quiet. Quiet, oh, I'm Quiet sorry. you're on a bell. <laughs> All right. Roll him. Speed. Action. Oh, Robin, my dear. Don't you remember me? For all that my hair is cut so short. Mary. Maid Mary. Your very own Maid Marion, Robin, dearest. Fry of talk, little John. Free Englishman. Archers all. It's Maid Marion. Good. That's it. Print it. All right. That's a wrap up here. Move over to stage three. <laughs> they were filming a new Technicolor version of Robin Hood over at the big studios in Santa Monica Boulevard, and I was there on salary at the request of the director of the picture. Robin Hood and Maid Marian came off the set. Robin Hood was a magnificent sight in his Lincoln green and carrying that big English long bow and quiver of arrows. Maid Marian in her slinkily cut medieval white gown was something to make more than an arrow whistle. They spied me and walked over to me quickly. Mr. Philip Marlowe? Yeah, that's all right. My name is Seward Spencer. Yeah, I know. This is my leading lady, Jenny Kane. Yeah, I know. How do you do, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, I, oh, uh, how do you do, Miss Kane? Uh, let's go over to stage nine and talk, shall we, Marlowe? Talk? Every time I open my mouth on one of these sets, somebody hollers, Quiet! Quiet! You see? Whatever happened to free speech in America? In Hollywood, anyway. Stage nine isn't a set. It's a little cafe across the street on Santa Monica. Oh. We have a lot to talk about, Marlowe. Yeah, I know. Let's go. You see, Marlowe, Demetro Sador, my director, hired you for what is to me a very embarrassing reason. It seems I'm supposed to protect you. And I feel very well able to take care of myself. Well, it's not safe for that half-mad brother of yours at large. Did, uh, did Mr. Sador tell you the whole story, Marlowe? I said for me to get it from you. Well, it was my fault that we ever sent for Caxton. But he's my brother, and he looks like me, and he's an absolutely terrific archer. Seward here is much better looking, though. Seward is the bow, but Caxton is the bowman, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, they could have faked the scenes where I'm supposed to perform marvels of archery, but, well, we were all against that. Man, I remembered my brother, a sporting goods salesman in Philadelphia, and the champion archer. And so you suggested that they send for Caxton to devil for you in the shooting scenes, huh? Yes, in spite of the fact that Caxton hates the sight of him. Go on. 
I told Mr. Sador he could get the shots he needed with Caxton doubling for me. I'd go to my lodge at Big Bear during those three days. Caxton always resented Seward here because he made good and Caxton didn't. Now, let's see. There was something about Caxton leaving Hollywood, only not leaving Hollywood. What about that? Well, he never picked up the return ticket that the studio reserved for him at the airport. You figure that Caxton's still in town, then, huh? Definitely. Hmm. You think he'd pick a fight with you? He, uh... He picked a fight with Freddie Cole. Who's Freddie Cole? A perfectly harmless makeup man on the lot. And all Freddie asked was for Caxton to wear brown contact lenses over his eyes so he'd look like Seward here for the medium close-ups. My brother has blue eyes, you see. And he wouldn't wear the brown contact lenses, huh? Well, he refused flatly. He said, let my big shot brother wear blue contact lenses. <laughs> what an unreasonable creature. I don't know. It sounds reasonable to me. You said that he uh, he fought with a makeup man, huh? Yes, but not for long. Freddy's half Caxton's size, but he knocked my brother kicking. Ooh. I suppose your brother swore to get him for that. How did you know? I don't know. Instinct. Good tomorrow. Oh. Very oh. oh, uh, here, uh, Mr. Sadar, here. No, Mr. Marlowe, this is terrible. Simply terrible. They just found Fred Cole in Sherwood Forest. He's been shot. Shot? Oh. What? How? Who? I don't know who. But there's two feet of arrow sticking out of his back. Oh. You better show me where Fred is, Mr. Sato. Come on, let's go on the double. Sherwood Forest is a wood where Doug Fairbanks Sr. made the silent version of Robin Hood. And they've called it that ever since. Freddie Cole was lying across the steps of the trailer that served as a field makeup room in Sherwood Forest. Mr. Sater's information was not correct. There were not two feet of arrow sticking out of Freddy's back. It was less than 18 inches. A bow of terrific power had done that job. Another trailer stood across the clearing from Freddy's body about 100 yards away. I walked through the clearing and knocked on the door. Yes, sir? The name's Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective. Oh, it's about poor Freddy. That's right. Come in, come in. Thank you. Well, I see. This trailer's my workshop, Mr. Marlowe. You have a regular arsenal of bows and arrows in here, haven't you? Yes, sir. I make and repair bows and arrows for the men in the picture. See, it's about 100 yards from here to where Freddy was shot, isn't it? Just about. Did you ever service the bow of Caxton Spencer, the star's brother? I did. Powerful weapon? Very. Good shot? Very. Bad man? Yes, very. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Dad. I'll see you. What was that you said? I said I'll see you. You called me something. Oh. Oh, Dad. Yes. So long, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> so long, Dad. So long, son. So long. murder on this lot is bad enough, but an unsolved murder is worse. I, I am very worried. About your star, Seward uh, Spencer, hmm? Among other things, Mr. Morrow. Well, why does Spencer, uh, why doesn't he leave town while this homicidal brother of his is still around? Oh, he, he wouldn't go even if I asked him. Besides, every day lost now means money, and the bank wouldn't tolerate any more delays making this picture. Any more delays? Have there been delays? I started making Robin Hood four years ago. I got the sets built and then had to stop because I couldn't find the ideal man to play Robin Hood. What was the ideal type of the promissary? Well, he had to be romantic, good-looking, powerful. Ah, and it would have been helpful if uh, he could shoot a longbow, huh? Yes, yes. Well, Seward Spencer couldn't shoot a longbow four years ago any better than he can today. Now, why, why didn't you hire him four years ago? He wasn't a big enough star then. Oh, I, he's big enough now, though. Tremendous. He's another Gable. Hmm. So he doesn't have to know how to shoot a longbow now. No, especially since his brother, who resembles him closely, could shoot a longbow. Tell me, where did uh, Spencer stay while his brother was whooping it up here at the studio? Spencer had a lodge up at the Big Bear. Why? Any ideas? Maybe. Look, Spencer is known all over the world, right? That is correct. Now, his double would have a hard time hiding out unless he hid in places where people expected uh, Seward to be, right? Oh, I hadn't thought about it. Where exactly is Spencer's lodge, Big Bear? You... 
You think his brother may be up there posing us, Spencer? I don't know. It's an idea. Where did you say that lodge was now? It was a peachy hunch, and I was proud of it. Proud. Only... No one answered my knock when I got up to Spencer's lodge at Big Bear. Getting in without a key was relatively small pumpkins. But it didn't pay off until I opened a closet door under a staircase. A body didn't fall out, but something else fell out, and I grabbed it before it hit the floor. It was a beautiful example of the bowmaker's art, curved and recurved and polished like glass under the thin layer of dust. I looked closely at the maker's name because I was beginning to get an idea. And then the grandfather of all hornets zinged past my ear. A fraction of an inch from my cheek quivered the shaft of a wicked-looking arrow, its steel head almost buried in the solid oak paneling behind me. A man was standing in the open doorway. Now then, Mr. Marlowe. Hey, what's the what's the idea? Make a move towards your gun, Marlowe, and I'll pin your hand to the wall. Caxton. Yes. Caxton Spencer, yes. right? Yeah. He was a little taller than his celebrated brother. His cheeks were a little more sunken, and his eyes, unlike his brother's, were an icy, glassy, deadly blue. He shot that second arrow as fast as I could think. Believe it or not, that second arrow split the first one right down to the head. There was another thing about this lad that was different from Seward Spencer. He could shoot a longbow. Brother, could he shoot a longbow. Well, aren't you going to reach for your gun? Well, Robin Hoodlum of Sherwood Forest, huh? You know what might be fun? A contest. The old versus the new. Medieval archer versus 20th century gunman. You know, you're just as crazy as your brother thinks you are. I see Seward's been talking too much again. Look, Caxton, tell me just one thing. You've got your archers mixed up. I'm Robin Hood, remember? Not William Tell. What was this dusty bow doing in the closet? That's mine. Well, how did it get in this closet? I was out here four years ago. Oh, you and your brother were a little friendlier then, huh? My brother wasn't such a big shot then. Beginning to get it, your brother sent for you four years ago to teach him how to shoot. You were looking for someone to play Robin Hood. Your brother wasn't a big enough name then, but he figured if he learned to shoot a longbow well enough, it might make up for other shortcomings. Not bad, genius. The Robin Hood picture was shelved before Seward could learn to shoot, so now he had to send for you again. But you had to quarrel with Freddy Cole and plant an arrow between his shoulder blades. Maybe somebody was celebrating Arbor Day and planting things. Uh -huh. It's very amusing, Jackson. But let me say this. Don't before... say anything. Just get off this case, understand? Else what? Else this. <laughs> Only next time, four inches more to the left. Catch? I catch. All right, don't forget it. Just don't you forget it. So long. So long. Keep your bows clean. Hello, operator. Operator. This is a police call. Connect me with the Santa Monica Boulevard Studios of Rheingold Pictures. I want to talk to a Mr. Seward Spencer. It's a matter of life and death. And that's no mere figure of speech. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. In a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say new Pepsodent is their favorite. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Paynes and other families who are asked to compare new Pepsodent with a toothpaste they were using at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mare. 
producers of The Romance of Rosie Ridge, starring Van Johnson. I couldn't reach Seward Spencer, the studio, to tell him that his brother was around and on the warpath. I hung up for a second. And I tried something else, just for fun, just another hunch. Hello, operator. Give me Western Union, please. It was late afternoon, and therefore too late to telephone Philadelphia on account of the time difference. I sent my telegram and gave my apartment address back in Hollywood for the answer that I expected in the morning. Then I drove back to Hollywood. It was dark when I gave up trying to locate Seward Spencer, but a bright moon was climbing the sky by the time I got to the archery trailer on location in Sherwood Forest. Yeah? Hello, Dad. Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Come in, Philip. Come in. Thanks. I'll leave the door open for a breath of air. If you don't mind a late visitor. Mind? I'm crazy about it. It's mighty lonely, Philip. Yeah, it would out here in this wilderness. Yeah, it does any place for old people. Well, can I offer you some hot coffee, son? Well, thanks, Dad. I'd appreciate it, but I'd, I'd rather have some information out of you. Uh, what is it, my boy? Tell me, is it possible for an expert archer to conceal the fact that he's deaf with a long bow? I think so. Well, can he conceal the fact that he can handle a bow at all? Oh, no, no. No matter how clumsy he was, he'd be too clumsy. Oh, I get it. Uh, like, a, like a guilty man trying to look innocent, he, he overdoes it. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Look, Dad, I'm going to pick up a bow, and I, I'm going to string it, put an arrow in it, and draw it. Now, I want you to stop me at any point where, where you can tell that I can't shoot a bow. All right. All right, I pick up this bow here. Well, you can stop now. Well, I, I didn't do anything yet. You picked up the bow, and you're holding it upside down. You mean there's an upside and a downside to these things? Does it matter? It matters very much. You might at least have played along with me a minute. After all, even a detective has his pride. You, you know. asked me to stop you, and I did. Oh, sure. I, I was just kidding you, Dad. <laughs> Dad, is anything wrong? No, nothing wrong. Excuse me. <laughs> just that everybody else calls me Pop. Oh, well, look now, if you'd rather I call you... No, that, no, I... I hate it. It's what smart, strong young people call old fellows like me. Pop, treating us like children. Old folks ain't idiots. Who says they are, Dad? No, Dad, that's different. It's got respect and love in it. <laughs> well, that's what we keep on calling you. You see, I haven't any children. Not anymore. Oh? I had a daughter... Not anymore. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, it's not what you think. She's alive. She just didn't want anybody to know she had me for a father. What? Just like she didn't want anybody to know she was married to a plain makeup man at the studio. It might hurt her career, her doggone old career. Dad, is your daughter in pictures? She's in this picture. She's playing Maid Marian. Jenny Kane is your daughter? Yes, and I'm telling you because you treat an old man respectful. Well, how could Jenny be your daughter and be so different? Well, people are like Bo's son, the same flesh and bone and blood, but entirely different. Now, look at this graceful little bow here. English yew wood. Pulls only 40 measly pounds, but it'll shoot as straight and as far as that 85-pound bow made out of the same material. Why? Workmanship and design. In people, it's called character. I mean, your girl Jenny got too big for Freddie, your makeup man husband, huh? Too big for him and too good for me. Dad, is Jenny in love with uh, Seward Spencer? Son, the girl's vain and proud and foolish, but she didn't kill Freddie. She couldn't pull that size bow. But you just said that a 40 pound bow of good design will do the work of much heavier bows. She didn't do it, boy. All right, all right. Look, you've seen Seward uh, shoot after a fashion. Does he handle a bow like a man who could do better but is concealing his real skill? Dad. Uh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking if Seward Spencer loved my girl, but she already had a husband that had to be got rid I'm, of... I'm asking you if Seward is faking his clumsiness with a long bow. No, son. The lad just can't handle a bow. He's the world's greenest archer. Well, then that puts the wrap right back on his brother Caxton, I guess. He had a motive threatened Fred Cole. Marlowe! 
I thought I told you something a few hours ago. I spun around. Caxton Spencer stood outside of the trailer in the yellow light flowing out of the doorway. He stood there casually. And casually balancing that powerful longbow in his left hand. I wondered how he'd found me here, of all places, hours after he'd left me at his brother's mountain lodge. He took a step near the trailer door. I told you to get off the case, didn't I? Why, oh, it just slipped my mind. Now, what do you want? I went back to the lodge after you left. Yeah? You sent a telegram to Philadelphia. Maybe. Not maybe, you did. I got the reply. That reply wasn't going to come in until morning into my apartment. Slight error, genius. You wired the public directory of Philadelphia asking about Caxton Spencer. It so happens they have a department that's open all night, and they wired back to the lodge. Funny thing, Marlowe. They say that no one named Caxton Spencer lives in Philadelphia. How, how did you find me here? I called the big director, Mr. Sador. He said you might be out here. That's funny. I knew that Sator never would have told that voice my whereabouts he'd have called the police. I looked with new interest at Caxton standing just outside of the trailer doorway. My examination got down to his shoes. The shoes were almost new, and his ankles were a full inch and a half above the tops of his Oxfords. Caxton Spencer was wearing elevator shoes to make him look taller. Well... Figured me out yet, Marlowe? I put it all together. I put it together fast. Caxton moved. He whipped an arrow into his bow, and my left leg shot out and kicked the door of the trailer shut. I jumped to the window and opened fire. Did you get him, son? No, I missed him. Missed him a mile. He's beat it now. Can't you see him anywhere? No. Yeah. I don't know. The moonlight out there in those bushes. Turn out the lights. Got us on the hook, Hank. Turn out the lights and get down on the floor. Got him. Got him. Get out. Get out. All right. All right. He's safe in here. He can't shoot through these walls. He's good, but he's not that good. I don't know, son. What do you mean you don't know? He might. He could get to us even in here. With a bow and arrow? He's smart and he's mean and he knows his way around this here forest. He can't shoot through this trailer. He can shoot through the windows. Well, we don't have to stand at the windows. He don't have to hit us. I don't get it. We got some scenes a while back while Caxton was with us. Robin Hood's men shooting flaming arrows into some old castle. Flaming arrows? Arrows soaked in pitch and set on fire. Old medieval custom. Oh, fine. There's plenty of that pitch still around here. Where? Out yonder, barrels of it. What did I tell you? There it is. There's the first of your flaming arrows. Come on, let's put it out. He'll pick us off if we try that. Well, then let's get out of here. Yeah, let's just do that. Look, I'll go out first. You follow me and lose yourself someplace. You understand? Old folks ain't idiots. All right, follow me. Now, keep low. Right after you, son. Keep low now. Yes. All right, run for it. We dashed into the moonlight. A hornet clipped my cheek and wanged into the wall of the trailer. Run, Dad, lose yourself. See you later, son. See you later. I dropped to the ground and didn't move, but my eye measured the angle of that last arrow in the side of the trailer and the direction it had come from. I raised myself on my elbow and fired back. Ah, uh, wise guy, huh? Oh, that dirty... Ju reload, Marlowe. Come on, reload, reload. You. Oh. <laughs> or is that one getting stale, Marlowe? Two shots left. Two shots. I've got two more arrows, Marlowe. That means one more is for fun, and the last one's for real, huh? One shot left. One shot. One. You cheap 10, 20, 30 ham! I waited for the laughter. The taunting, baked ham laughter. It didn't come. I waited with my empty gun clenched in my fist.
He was coming toward me. He knew I'd fired 14 shots and that I was finished. He could hit me from any distance. Why was he moving in on me? What was new? What was dirty with Caxton now? I jumped to my feet and drew back my arm to throw my gun at the first thing that walked out of those bushes ahead of me. Don't throw it, son. What? Hold it. Oh, Dad. You all right, son? Where's Caxton? Dead. I got him, then. With my last shot, I got him. Hate to disappoint a smart young lad like you, son. Oh, no, you, you said he's dead. I didn't say you killed him. What? He's got a 28-inch arrow in his chest. Looks good, too. How, how did you... How when did... I followed you out of the trailer, I grabbed some arrows in that 40-pound bow. I've been hunting, son. And let me tell you, for what... There never was a Caxton Spencer. Do tell. Caxton Spencer fought against wearing brown contact lenses over his eyes for a very good reason. He was already wearing blue contact lenses. Seward Spencer never had a brother. He'd learned to shoot a longbow four years ago, but he kept it a secret when they finally decided to film Robin Hood. He had a better use for his skill with a bow. He was already planning Fred Cole's murder and invented a non-existent brother to pin the murder on. Clever, very clever. I knew it all the time. What? That's what. Well, then why did you tell me that Seward Spencer couldn't shoot? Seward Spencer corrupted my girl and turned her against her rightful husband and her daddy. I wanted to get him myself. And you did. Fair and square and in defense of an officer of law. That's right. Well, I see that flaming arrow trick fizzled. It went out. Oh, oh, yeah, so it did. Like to step inside and have that coffee now, son? I sure would. Then come on. You know, like you said, Dad... Watch your step. Just like you told me, old folks aren't fools. Not by a long shot, Dad. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the mystery series Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Van Heflin will return in just a moment. Men, here's an important announcement. News about a sensational hair tonic discovery. It's Trim Hair Tonic, made by Pepsodent. For the first time, science has created a hair tonic with pure virgin olive oil. There's no finer hair and scalp conditioner. Yes, because it contains pure virgin olive oil, Trim Hair Tonic conditions your scalp as it grooms your hair. Get new Trim Hair Tonic during the big one-cent introductory sale at toilet goods counters now. Two 60-cent bottles, $1.20 value, only 61 cents. Ask for Trim Hair Tonic with olive oil. Now, concerning next week, here again is Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe paused in the stealthy darkness of the deserted brewery. There was invisible death lying in wait for him down in the bottom of the unused fermentation vat. But a very visible, dancing death was approaching behind him, dancing and weaving. And at the two risks... Philip Marlowe, unarmed and stunned, preferred the invisible one at the bottom of the great wooden vat. Tonight's story was written by Milton Geiger, based on the famous character and modern detective fiction... Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at the same time to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with the distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.